Hello, Stuart. Hi there, Mark. So I am Mark Shapiro, uh, Artistic Director and Conductor of Cantor New York, and I am with composer Stuart Greenbaum. Where are you, Stuart? I'm in Melbourne and in our Melbourne Conservatorium of Music building, which was built about two or three years ago, which is quite close to the heart of the city and the arts precinct. Tell, you were telling me about the view before I hit record. Tell me about the view. Well, the, the view that you can see uh, behind me is uh, some of the city uh, residential towers adjacent to our Royal Botanic Gardens. So it's quite a nice, uh, if you could be bothered at lunchtime to actually get that far, uh, it's a fantastic place to walk through to uh, uh, get a different spin on the day and nature. And have a sandwich. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so we are speaking because Cantor New York will be premiering uh, your composition Brought to Light, which we commissioned from you. Tell us about, let's say, the parameters of the piece. We'll start, let's start there. Well, it was you and I getting back in conversation uh, because we've known each other uh, on and off for actually uh, decades. Yeah. That, uh, that was the idea of doing uh, an evening length piece. Uh, and so uh, uh, the more I thought about the idea of writing uh, a 60 minute work in multi movements was really attractive. Uh, a great challenge, uh, a wonderful canvas to um, have a go at. And, uh, and, and so also I got uh, Ross Baglin, my uh, great Australian friend who actually lives in London these days to write the text. He writes the text for all of my works that have words. And, uh, and, and so the theme brought to light is uh, ostensibly about going into a dark tunnel and coming back, being brought back to light at the other end of it. Uh, and, and that is both a comment on modern infrastructure and tunnels and trains and subways, but also actually is a metaphor for life and the journeys that, that we go through. And as it's been a, a complex and difficult two years with the pandemic worldwide, uh, maybe there's also another layer or metaphor that we didn't set out to write about, but in the review mirror now looks quite relevant also, uh, the idea that, that we are coming back into the world again, into the light. Absolutely. And I think the timing of our performance is going to be kind of perfect uh, if the stars align as we are thinking they will be, that we really will be really opening in full by May in New York. That would really be... You know, we're just about there, I think. So um, I was thinking we should back up a little and you mentioned that we've known each other for decades, but of course we never actually saw each other in person until everybody discovered Zoom uh, during the pandemic. So our correspondence had been, I think, by letter. When it was we actually letter back in maybe um, 1990 or somewhere in that was, vicinity, Yeah, uh, I, long enough ago. But it was letter, it wasn't yeah. even email. Right. The internet was Sorry. still a gleam in Al Gore's eye. Yes. And, uh, yeah. and, and I can say uh, uh, confidently that uh, back then, getting a letter from New York uh, saying, uh, we'll, we'll sing your piece was, uh, was quite something. That was a really wonderful uh, start to that connection. It was great. And uh, just for our, those who are viewing this, um, you responded, I think, to a call for scores that Cantori put out uh, yeah. with a piece, with two pieces, and the one we called it was called Upon the Dark Water, is that what it was? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that was also with text by Ross Bagland. Yes, Paul indeed. So, so I've been, so as long as uh, we've known each other, um, Ross Bagland and I have also been working together. So, so you and Ross and I um, have uh, interesting connections of uh, composers, conductors, and poets for some decades. Yeah, it's really wonderful to think about. And uh, the genesis of this piece was that um, I was celebrating my 30th season as Cantori's artistic leader. Uh, and then COVID blew all that out of the water. But one of the, I was thinking, who would I really like to work with um, as a composer for this? And after we did your Upon the Dark Water, we commissioned a piece from you 
called The Foundling, uh, which we all loved. And I'm pleased to tell you there are a few people in the group who are still there from those days and their recollections of those pieces remain very vivid and very warm. So I think there's a lot of excitement that will come, but even among the handful of old timers we have, the idea of coming back to you is just great. Um, so me too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's really been, we, you, you and I have had a lot of conversations on Zoom and it feels like it's really been recapturing a friendship that uh, we knew was there, but we'd been out of touch really for quite a while. So um, we can say, let's see, the, the piece is, as you mentioned, an hour, and we can mention it's all choral, few incidental solos, and it's for string, sextet, and, vibra and percussion, uh, including vibraphone. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how you hit on the instrumentation. Uh, not easily, because uh, any time when composers typically want to work with uh, a cast of thousands, uh, but, but then uh, we don't always need to. And I have students who uh, 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 want to write film music with orchestras. And one of my favorite films to show them is The Firm, because uh, the soundtrack to that by Dave Grusin is just solo piano. And it's fantastic. It's amazing. Uh, but, uh, and it's a, a timely reminder to all and sundry that you don't actually need a full orchestra to do amazing things. So when you've got something in between an orchestra and solo piano, let's say seven musicians, uh, it's, it's a different kind of, uh, not so much a problem, it's a conundrum because you have to think, uh, what do you really want? And at one point I actually had included harp in that mix. And then maybe I thought, uh, you know, I love writing for woodwinds, uh, but actually the more, the more and more I looked, the more and more I liked the idea of a string sextet, it's a string quartet with an extra second cello and also a double bass. And that string sextet is something that I've written for in a couple of other works and gotten to know and love as a sonic uh, combination. So then came down to, if I was going to write for that sextet, uh, what would I add to that? And that also would work well with the voices and the words and the overall concept. And, and so uh, vibraphone came back and, and there's a synergy there also with the foundling because the foundling uh, also written for Cantor in New York was for string quartet and vibraphone. So this adds um, a, uh, a couple of low, extra low strings and some extra auxiliary percussion uh, and a lot of extra time to the canvas to, uh, to in comparison to the foundling. Yes, and uh, I think we had an interesting exchange about the percussion where I was, I think, encouraging you to add a few toys that um, you were originally, I think it was only vibraphone, is that right? Yeah, it was, it was originally vibraphone and then I think the next edition was maybe three suspended symbols. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's like opening Pandora's box. And so uh, uh, through our uh, regular Zoom meetings and, 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 and this beautiful process of fine polishing and refining not only the voicing of the choir, but the color and pacing of the work, we added in uh, a bass drum, which yeah. at, at times adds some real gravitas. And we added a rain stick or a shaker, uh, I think a triangle, uh, and some wind chimes. Uh, yes, and don't right. love wind chimes. Who, what's <laughs> not to like with a good set of wind chimes? That's, it was the icing on the cake. Uh, they can ring on sometimes unexpectedly, but you still have to love them. Yes, that's right. Um, so can you walk us through a little bit, uh, sort of briefly movement by movement, what uh, uh, the textures that you found and uh, um, anything you want to say about each movement in particular? So I've got the text in front of me and, and, and taking a, a, a little bit of a look through that. It's in six movements um, and they get uh, gradually shorter. That is 12, 10, uh, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, getting the, the movements get shorter. And then the final movement is 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's like medium to small. And then finally at the finale then is, is the biggest. Um, I love thinking, even before getting up to 
the words and, and, and setting. I, I love architectural shapes, things that contract and expand. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's true in small ways of how the music comes across. I think the music uh, has is probably maybe described as post-minimal. There, there are a lot of oscillating patterns and textures and layers without being pure minimalism. Um, there's, Can you help uh, us understand the distinction you're making in terms of sound? Well, there's lots of melody, uh, but there's also uh, in the strings and vibraphone, there are a lot of uh, patterns that, that shimmer and oscillate that create motion. Mm -hmm. uh, and working out where that motion would go and where it might be more spacious uh, is always uh, interesting for composers to think where, did, where, where should the music flow like a constant stream and where do you uh, interrupt or allow spaciousness or silence? And the silence happens, of course, does happen between the movements. Um, all six movements have some level of silence in, in between, but sometimes even you get uh, a breath or a gap uh, within the movements themselves. Um, the first movement uh, talks about um, uh, building a tunnel uh, and the idea of um, uh, the trains that, that would pass through it and how we would pass through that also. Uh, so it's a building movement in a lot of ways and the music in that way sort of flows and builds in that way. Um, and in the that second movement, movement, I just want to ask you, there, there's when I've been thinking about that movement, there is a feeling of kind of um, industrious optimism or optimistic industry. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think so. And I think um, um, because also uh, there are our own experiences of when we go into, I mean, what does it, depending on your personality and whether you are, uh, um, are freaked out by being uh, under a, uh, a sea or a river and whether that might collapse. Uh, 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 in, in engineering, we trust, I suppose, could also be the motto here. But there's something um, uh, quite exciting about the advent, uh, about the outset of a journey. And sometimes going into a tunnel can be quite uh, interesting and intriguing. But increasingly, as we get into the second, third, fourth, uh, fifth movements, we um, we progress deeper and you get further from the light. And I think at that point, you need uh, to hold an intellectual sense that there really is actually something on, at the other side. Uh, and so, so the work in some ways gets slower and darker as it progresses into its middle. Yeah. And finally, in the final movement, um, well, a couple of things happened. Uh, we actually, uh, you and I had a long conversation about the fourth and fifth movements, which I completely rewrote. Not so much because uh, there, were, there were things that I miss in those original versions of the fourth and fifth, things that I uh, really liked. But we talked strategically about uh, changing uh, the, the point where, where you get so deep in uh, into a work, at what point do you need uh, something radically different to, yeah. to, to, to keep you... Um, uh, alert and uh, and awake and so in the fourth movement it's for male voices only and in the fifth movement it's female voices only and and the strings and percussion also totally change in their combination uh to to go with that so it kind of breaks down it uh, the, the, the whole group in, in, into smaller components precisely with the idea that then when the sixth movement starts the longest one um we get to experience um, uh, the depth, the darkness. Um, and I love those uh, moments musically. Um, uh, I like to, uh, it, it might be gloomy, uh, but I'm always uh, uh, seeking quality gloomy, yeah. if there is such a thing. Uh, that is the, the the gloom that uh, somehow is intriguing and absorbing and 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 pulls you in in a way that is um, um, that has its own intrigue. And Do you I, have I, models I, for that in your compositional pantheon. Well, look, look interestingly, even though uh, um, you know I love Arvo Pert and, and Steve Reich and, and Pat Metheny, and I love. Um, 
a lot of the great classical composers, um, Rachmaninoff and, uh, and others. In actual fact, uh, in terms of that, if you like that darkness and that gloominess, um, I really like 1970s Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. where they're instrumental, not so much, not so much the song bits, uh, but the bits where they just, just have these instrumental uh, passages that, that bubble away, um, like on In Sheep from Animals, where almost nothing happens, but it's very, very moody. And I'm really drawn to the idea of atmosphere and moodiness. I think it's uh, above anything else, before I even look at what stylistic influences might be sort of flowing through my um, ears from other people's music at any point in time, um, I think increasingly I seek atmosphere and moodiness. Did you ever hear Pink Floyd in concert? I've never heard them live, no. Mm -hmm. I should get out more. <laughs> well, um, now we but I have start. all of their albums, and, and, I, and I had study leave about five, six years ago, and I bought every last album, and I sat down one week uh, for about two or three days, and from the very start, the late 60s, right through to the present day, even though uh, some members are no longer there, um, I listened to all of it in order, and I found that quite fascinating too. There's something something lovely, whether, whether it's a rock group or a classical composer or or an art exhibition in a gallery or reading all the works of Shakespeare, whatever you're into, to get absorbed in the work of one artist or group uh, deeply can be a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, and well, it's great that you were able to do it with them. Um, yeah. tell, tell me a bit uh, more about how you found Ross Baglin back in the day. This is again the poet who wrote the uh, text for Brought to Light and as you said is the only poet you work with. Um, and I, I have to say I, I, in the, the pieces that I've encountered where he's written the words, he is extraordinary at exactly that. So yes. um, yeah, I, I mean the, the musicality of what he does and but I, I've, I don't know anything else about him. Uh, and, uh, you know, does he write for other composers or are you it? Or tell me more. Uh, he, look, he doesn't, for many years, he was the uh, HR manager for Africa and Europe for Shell. He has a dark side of working for petrochemical companies. I see. Uh, so, so, so uh, but, but he and I have written a lot over the years, including Upon the Dark Order, The Foundling, and now Brought to Light. But we met not in classical music. We met when we were undergraduates at Melbourne University, and uh, he, uh, I joined his rock band, uh, which was falling apart. And when I, by the time I joined, it was falling apart even quicker. Um, uh, it was just the accident of who we were working with, and we didn't have a drummer, and then we didn't have a singer. Uh, but we liked the songwriting, and so we were writing these pop songs. And finding uh, that while we didn't actually have a gig and we didn't really know what we were doing as a band, uh, the songwriting was really uh, um, drawing us in. And that then morphed into writing art song and choral pieces, two operas, and, and now this, uh, this, this fifth choral symphony brought to light, which is an hour long. And so working with Ross, um, I don't just say... Um, here's the piece, send me the words, and then I set it. Um, as you and I have spent a lot of time in, in recent months um, refining, honing, uh, and, and, and improving the work musically, so, so too I worked with Ross in a similar way uh, as his dramaturg, as I always do, and in, in uh, suggesting the, the lines that I like and the lines that I don't. And, and if you're Ross, uh, 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 spare a thought for poor Ross when he gets his words back from me and I've highlighted in blue what I love and I've highlighted in red what I think can definitely go and and of course the things that are highlighted in red are um, uh, uh, he uh, probably really loves and, 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 and so, so it's a challenging process but if you've known somebody for a long time uh, uh, and you've worked well together you, you build a level of trust yeah. Uh, about and the preparedness to let somebody else uh, critique you, and you have to you have to get up the next morning and say, okay, that uh, uh, is that still something uh, uh, that I want, or am I changing it? What am I doing? And 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 so we have to go back to the well and and ask the question over and over: uh, yeah, Is that, this still yeah. what I really want? 
I think that whole question of trust is a very interesting one uh, between performers, composers, composers, librettists, and um, Cantori has been doing so many newer pieces now. And I think that relationship with the composer is so important, you know, and how you how you really feel. I think I think of my own role as one to really try to see into your soul and do my best to help you say what I think you're trying to say to the extent that I can be helpful at all. Um, and I think it's 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 a it's not to say that people need need help, but I think everybody it's so helpful to have a, a another perspective so, it's in, in in i used to work um uh just down the road a couple of blocks for a theater company um in my younger days and um i loved working uh for the theater of course in the theater having a dramaturg and having workshops is standard yeah for some reason in classical contemporary music uh we have this uh strange arcane idea that the composer uh, uh, climbs the mountain, receives uh, the tablets like Moses, comes back down the mountain and says, here are the notes, folks, don't change anything. Yeah. Uh, it's mad. It's not that clever. <laughs> Why do we do that? Uh, I'm with you on that one. So, um, and we think, so we think there's a chance you might be able to come to New York for this performance, right? We're not sure yet. Well, I've got, I've got leave from work and, and I've got my canoe ready to paddle. If okay. only they'll let me out of the harbor. All right. Well, so, it's... so, so I'm very much hoping to, to, to be there. And, uh, uh, he, he's hoping that the, uh, the gods and customs and passport control folk think that's a good idea too. It would be an unbelievable thrill to meet in person after 30 years. Yeah. So totally, I, I, yeah. I'm, uh, uh, I'm so looking forward to it. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to stop the recording and say thank you so much, Stu. And uh, we're all looking forward to this piece enormously. Well, thanks for uh, asking for the piece, Mark and Cantori. And, uh, and I hope uh, everyone uh, 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 finds it and, and, and can make it to come in here. I... Exactly. <laughs>